eight badminton players were disqualified from the Olympics back in 2012 for playing to lose. Now, they weren't bribed to lose, and they didn't collude with their opponents either. They were stuck in tournament rules so badly designed that it was actually strategically correct for them to lose. So if you'd like to avoid making tournament rules so bad that it makes players play to lose on purpose, then I can help. Eight elite athletes who were deliberately and flagrantly losing their matches. Why? ABC's Bill Weir leads our coverage again tonight from the London Olympic Games on the scandal and the celebration. And while Great Britain broke their gold medal drought with wins in rowing and cycling today, London is also buzzing about badminton and the eight players expelled from the games, not for doping, but for losing on purpose in order to avoid stronger teams in the next round. This is the way elite badminton usually looks. But this is the way America's arch rival, the Chinese top seeds play, deliberately serving into the net again and again, eight times, despite a chorus of booms and a warning from officials. Then watch this. China lets it drop and South Korea follows up by serving it way outside the line. An Indonesian team followed suit by tanking and the South Korean head coach admitted the Chinese started this, so we did the same. Remember, this is not backyard barbecue badminton. This is the fastest racket sport in the world where the shuttlecock can travel for over 200 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour faster than Andy Roddick's serve. And lightning foot shuttlers wear each other down with cunning and finesse. And in Britain, every town has a club where devotion is second only to soccer and cricket. Very unsportsmanlike. That would never happen in your club. I don't think the British team would behave like that. But she's not above teaching a clumsy American in socks to respect oh, see, this okay. game. I gotta tell you, against a pro, the birdie is a blur. And as for the Chinese, South Korean and Indonesian teams, they could face further sanctions from the IOC. South Korean's appeal was rejected today. And Diane, as for the fans who paid good money to watch actual games, the IOC is considering giving them refunds. Why did these players lose on purpose? It has to do with the tournament structure that the Badminton World Federation came up with. The general way it works is pretty common, but they made a really important mistake. One way of doing a tournament is you start in one format, you get a certain way through, and then you cut to a different format. That can work as long as you know what you're doing. So in this case, when the badminton tournament, we'll start with pools where the top two players are going to advance, and then they get to the second format of the tournament, which in their case, is a single elimination tournament. The problem here comes from the transition from the pool matches to the single elimination tournament. So let's say we're in the very last match of one of the pools. So we're seeing who's going to get first and who's going to get second in the pool. Well, what do you get if you get first versus if you get second? Either way, first or second, you're going to advance and no one else in your pool is you're going to be put into a big single elimination bracket. The reason it matters to get first or second in the pool in this particular tournament is that if you get first, you get a more favorable seeding in the single elimination tournament than if you get second. So in other words, the opponent that you're going to face if you win the pool is going to be a weaker opponent than the opponent you're going to face if you got second place in the pool. That was the theory at least, but what happens when the bracket doesn't shake out that way? Maybe there's some upsets. In this specific badminton tournament, when the players were playing that last match in the pools, they already knew what the single elimination bracket looked like. They knew exactly which team they were going to face if they won the pool, and they knew exactly which they would face if they got second place in the pool. And it turns out, if they got second place, actually they would face an easier opponent. So what should they do in that situation? Knowing that if they lose the match, they have a better chance of winning the tournament. Well, it's clear they should lose the match and they did. They were disqualified for this and told that their play made a mockery of the sport and that it was also unsportsmanlike or against the spirit of competition. To the first point that they made a mockery of the sport. Oh, absolutely. They definitely did that. It's ridiculous to watch people play badminton to lose or any sport or any game to lose. It makes everyone involved look stupid and the whole thing look like a farce. But to the second point that what they did is against the spirit of competition. No, I don't think so. That kind of language about sportsmanship or a spirit of competition. That sounds like it might make sense if this were the first time we were ever encountering this sort of thing. But 
I've seen this movie a lot of times and I, I know how it goes. I know what these terms mean and how they're used. It's so common to see situations where a player is doing something in a game that we just don't like. Maybe they're playing a fighting game and they're throwing too many fireballs, or maybe they're playing a first person shooter and they're camping the spawn point just a little bit too long. And we don't like it and we want to trash talk them. The players in these examples are doing their best to win whatever that looks like, no matter how boring it is. They're just playing to win. And often people who are unable to come up with good tournament rules just kind of want to trash talk them for doing things that are necessary to win and calling them unsportsmanlike or whatever. In this particular case, in the badminton example, it's especially hilarious because the players here are doing their best to win this tournament. They actually have more of a respect for the concept of like playing as hard as they can to win than the other team or the referees. I mean, the people who are showing the most respect for competition are the ones maximizing their chances to win it, which in this totally crazy backwards case are the players who are trying to lose this particular match, lose this match, but win the tournament. This whole thing is embarrassing, but it's not embarrassing for the players. They're victims in this story. They're victims of these bad rules. It's embarrassing for the Badminton World Federation. It's embarrassing that they created these rules in the first place. It's embarrassing that they ignored experts who told them ahead of time that these rules had problems and that this was a predictable thing that was going to happen. It's embarrassing that when the predictable thing did happen, they tried to scapegoat players. I tried to see if the Badminton World Federation had ever apologized for their atrocious actions here or had apologized to the victims, these players who they had basically slandered. To my knowledge, they never did. And I think it remains a stain on the sport to this day. How could this fiasco have been avoided? Well, better rules. I've been involved in deciding the rules and structure of many, many different tournaments over the course of decades. And I used to be one of the people responsible for this for the Evolution Fighting Game Championships, which is the biggest fighting game tournament in the country. At Evolution, we used different tournament structures in different years, but we often used this same concept of starting with pools and then cutting to an elimination bracket. There's a key difference in how we did it, though, and the key is that losses didn't reset. Losses didn't reset. So when you were in pools and you were playing that final match and you were either going to win and be undefeated in your pool or lose and get second place, a big difference was at stake. If you won, then you leave your pool with zero losses and you are put in the winner's bracket of a double elimination tournament. If you lost that last match, then you would keep that loss when you were moved to the bracket. You're put in the loser side of a double elimination bracket. And that makes a big difference. You have to win fewer matches in the winner's bracket in order to win the whole tournament. Then you have to win in the loser's bracket. But also, even more importantly than that, if you're in the winner's bracket and you lose, you're not out of the tournament. You can keep playing and still try to win. But if you're in the loser's bracket and you lose, it's over. The idea is that you had, in this example, one loss in pools and then a second loss in the bracket, and so that's two total and you're out. Because losses did not reset when going from pools to the bracket, we completely avoided the problem in this badminton example. You definitely wanted to win your pools match. That's not the only solution to this type of thing, though. In the example I just gave, when you make it out of pools, you are put in a double elimination bracket. But what if the tournament organizer doesn't want to use a double elimination bracket? They need things to end sooner, or for whatever reason, wants to use a single elimination bracket. One of my friends was involved in a World of Warcraft tournament that used that exact structure. If you made it out of pools, you were put in a single elimination bracket, and that means that losses do reset. Just like in the badminton example here in this World of Warcraft tournament, losses do reset. Okay, well, so why should you want to get first or second? Well, they encountered the same exact problem that the badminton tournament faced. The top two players from the pools are going to be put into a single elimination bracket, and the one who wins is supposedly going to have a better seed than the one who loses, but what if it doesn't shake out that way? And so the answer, which probably is obvious, is that the winner really needs to be able to choose which of the two slots they're going to go in, and then the loser goes in the other one. So that's exactly how that tournament worked. It didn't have any problems, and nobody played to lose, at least not for that reason. There's another thing that bothers me about this badminton example, and let me give you a quick analogy. Getting into a car crash is a bad, dangerous thing. We don't want that. We don't want car crashes. But sometimes car crashes happen. And so 
maybe we should have airbags. Maybe we should have something that lessens the damage when the bad thing happens. Likewise, we don't want fake matches to be played in a tournament. That is a problem. That's a bug in the software. It's a mistake and we need to fix the rules for that. But somehow, maybe accidentally, somewhere in here, there's an incentive for somebody to play a fake match. Maybe it's not even for the same reason or anything like this example from badminton, but it could happen. We hope it doesn't happen, but if it does, then we can try to lessen the effect if we can. Think about this from the perspective of the people running the tournament. When would they rather have a fake match versus a forfeit? I'm going to give you my answer. It's that there is never, ever a situation where a fake match is preferable to a forfeit. The question really comes down to this. Do we want to make a public spectacle out of the problem? Do we want to look like incompetent idiots and make a mockery of the sport and put a spotlight on this huge problem we have in our rules? Or do we want it to go by kind of quietly, mostly unnoticed, and then take responsible action behind the scenes to fix these rules for next time? I can't think of any reason why anyone running a tournament would want to uh, play a fake match, unless it has to do with, you know, they sold tickets for it, but that's a huge problem as well. This issue is on the top of my mind when I was involved with planning the rules for the Evolution Tournament. Different tournament rules can have different strengths and weaknesses. There's trade-offs, but in my opinion, there is no such thing as any set of rules for a tournament that produces fake matches and it's somehow worth it. There's somehow a trade-off that makes that okay. No, it's not. It's never okay. It's almost the worst possible thing you could do other than just outright cheating being legalized. And because it's so bad and a lot worse than someone just forfeiting, this is something I tried to impress upon the players as they got closer and closer to the end of our big tournaments. There were cases where I advised players before they were about to play their big match, look, we are asking you, it's not a hard rule, okay? We're asking you, please don't ever play a fake match. But the rule that I want you, the player, to be aware of is that you can forfeit. If you have any reason that you want to forfeit a match, you can. And if you are going to play a fake match, please, please forfeit instead of doing that. Because you make all of us look so stupid when you play a fake match. I think that's a really important consideration in making tournament rules. I know there are some tournaments that say you can't forfeit. And it sounds so crazy. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons that someone would want to forfeit. Maybe they have health problems. Maybe they're not feeling well that day. Maybe they have an anxiety or panic attack about having to play this big tournament on stage. I don't know. Maybe they found out a loved one died and they're grieving. I have no idea what's going on with competitors and I don't necessarily want to know. If they don't want to play in a tournament, they should not play. And that includes if they were going to play a fake match. I used to say a long time ago that I thought it should be a right of any player in a tournament to forfeit for any reason. Well, I've had to amend that a little bit. I think that's mostly true, but not any reason. There are one or two that actually are not okay. If someone says that they're going to forfeit because a third party paid them off to lose, some kind of gambling organization that's betting on the results, well, we can't really allow that. We can't say, yes, it's okay to forfeit for that reason, because then we just allowed bribery and it undermines the entire tournament. Similarly, we can't really allow you to forfeit for reasons like, well, I'm losing on purpose to this person so that they can lose on purpose to me in the next tournament or something like that. That also undermines the point of the tournament. So when it comes to actual cheating in the tournament, uh, those are not good reasons, but almost anything else you really should be able to forfeit for. And yeah, that is a squishy rule, and it's really unfortunate. I wish we didn't have to have rules like that in a tournament, but there isn't really an alternative. We definitely can't have the rule that unlimited bribery is completely allowed, so we kind of have to have the rule that it's not allowed, and we also accept that it's not going to be possible to detect it in all cases, but still, we need the rule anyway. This leads us to a second common source of fake matches. In order to understand that, let's talk about two terms from game theory. The terms are lame duck and kingmaker. So first, lame duck. That's from American politics, where a president who is at the end of their last term, they're on their way out, it's difficult for them to get things done because people tend not to listen to them. They're right at the end of their tenure of power. And the game design version of that is this. 
a lame duck is a player who is playing a game and has reached a point in that game where it is now impossible for them to win the game, literally impossible, but they're still playing it. Or a secondary definition, if we zoom out a little bit, don't look at the progress within a game, but imagine we are playing in a tournament, so we're playing a series of many games. And in that tournament, we've reached a point where we can't win the tournament. It's mathematically impossible, but we are still in the tournament. We are a lame duck in that case. A kingmaker is a related term. A kingmaker in a game is a lame duck, someone who is not themselves going to win, but whatever moves they make determine who else does win. Or a secondary definition, if we zoom out, a kingmaker is someone who is playing a tournament and has reached a point in the tournament where they cannot possibly win it, but the next match they play, whether they win or lose that match, might affect who else actually does win the whole tournament. Kingmakers are a big problem. When you're designing a game, you want the rules to be resistant to kingmakers, and usually that means try to remove lame duck players from the game so they are not playing anymore, so they can't possibly determine who's going to win amongst the people still playing. Or if, if you do want them to still play and kind of have fun and participate, then try to somehow minimize their ability to king make, but that's difficult. And it's the same thing when we zoom out and use the scale of a tournament. There, a kingmaker is really causing havoc, but also is ripe for corruption. They're ripe to be bribed or something. So if someone is in a tournament but can't possibly win it themselves, then we really hope they're either removed for the tournament or they can't ever go up against people uh, who might win the tournament. And that brings us to a big scandal in sumo wrestling that broke in 2011. In these tournaments, each sumo wrestler is playing 15 matches, and they're trying to get eight or more wins. If they get eight or more, then they qualify. The sumo scandal was exposed by Freakonomics, so here's them saying a few words about it. People who are being corrupt are always trying to actively cover their trail. So corruption is by its nature hard to identify, hard to prove. Murder is really great because almost always when someone's murdered, there's a corpse. As you might say, as an outsider, how would you know if someone's cheating? And the answer is, well, it's in the data. I don't have to ever have seen a sumo match. I can go in the data, I can look at it, and I can tell you with almost complete certainty that there was rampant cheating going on. In professional sumo tournaments, the wrestlers fight one bout per day for 15 days. If you win uh, eight out of the 15 matches, you can move up in rank half a slot. The difference of half a rank can be maybe $5,000 in paycheck a month, the respect you get in the sumo association. So when you talk about stuff like that, that eight win, it's real critical. Arikshi entering a tournament's final 15th match with a 7-7 seven and seven record has far more to gain from a victory than an opponent with a record of, say, 8-6 and six has to lose. If a wrestler has eight wins under his belt, he is guaranteed to advance, even if he loses that last match, so he can afford to take a fall. In Japan, there's a term for match rigging, yaocho. Many suspected that sumo matches might be rigged, but it is nearly impossible to prove unless you look closely at the numbers. Two wrestlers who I would expect to have an even match, when one of them needs the eighth win and the other doesn't, the one who needs it wins 75% of the time rather than 50% of the time. That is a huge deviation. I, eight and six wrestler, let you, seven and seven wrestler, win this deciding match because you, my friend, are gonna fall down the pyramid if you don't. In return, the next time those two guys meet, lo and behold, the eight and six wrestler almost always wins those matches. What's interesting about this example is it's the reverse of the usual case where a lame duck player is king making for someone else. Here, the players who have eight or more wins, they're the ones that are more analogous to a lame duck. They're not literally a lame duck because uh, they've already qualified, but it's conceptually similar because they're in a situation where it no longer matters if they win or lose because they've already qualified. So if they got one more loss, nah, that's not really that big of a deal. And it's possible that they're going to meet someone who has a seven and seven record. And it's absolutely critical that that person wins that last match. 
The Freakonomics data for the situation was really damning. The players who had a 7-7 seven and seven record and who were going into that last match against someone that had an 8-6 record should be winning those matches about 50-50, maybe a little bit less than 50, but they were actually winning them 80% of the time. And in case there's any doubt, it was really damning to look at those same pairs of players when they faced each other in the next tournament. Then the results are completely reversed, and the players who had that 80% win rate in the last situation now had only a 40% win rate. So they were obviously trading one win for another in one event to the next. The people in charge of the sumo sport took this very seriously, or at least it looks that way from the outside. They took a number of measures to curtail this. They started by expelling 23 players who were guilty of this kind of win trading. They also instituted a bunch of policy changes that were really aimed at the human angle here. They were aimed at making competitors care more about not cheating and logistically making it a little bit harder to set up those deals right before the matches. But to me, the more interesting thing has to do with changing a rule. Starting in 2012, so the year after the scandal, they changed the way the matchmaking works. Now the matchmaking system is very aggressive in trying to make sure that anyone with a 7-7 seven and seven record is playing against someone else with a 7-7 seven and seven record in that last match on the last day of the tournament. I think that makes sense because anyone that has a 7-7 seven and seven record, it means they're just one away from qualifying. They both really want to qualify and neither one is ripe for this match throwing corruption. So in conclusion, be really careful about your tournament rules, especially if you're cutting from one format to another within a same tournament. Also, don't blame the players for doing their best to win and let them forfeit if they need to. I know this video is about playing to lose, but did you know I wrote a book called Playing to Win? You can read it for free. I'll put the link in the comments below, or you can buy a physical copy on Amazon or a Kindle copy. So check that out if you're interested, or maybe look at some of my board games at serlingames.com. And if you have any stories about tournaments with crazy bad rules that led to some sort of fiasco, then share them in the comments with us.